basically my background is both in ear, nose, throat, head and neck surgery as well as facial plastics. And they do lend themselves uh, to kind of build one to the other quite well. Um, in my case, I've done a lot of training additionally specific to facial plastics. And um, I've tried to provide these seminars kind of as an educational forum for the community. And they encourage us to do this through our academy. And as we go through the beginning of the presentation, I want to get a little bit into what it means to be a facial plastic surgeon. Because of course, nowadays as you turn on the television or open the magazines or flyers, you'll see advertisements for aesthetic procedures and treatments and various things and come, for, come at you from all directions, really. In this realm, because it's essentially cash, you know, it's a business, it's all buyer beware. It's like going out and buying a car or a flat screen TV. Unless you do your research, you may not get the product that you're looking for. So as far as facial plastics, just the general background, um, it's an academy that's been a group of physicians together with the same thoughts and mindset for decades, since the 40s. And you'll see a lot of advances in plastic and reconstructive surgery during wartime, unfortunately. Um, in World War II, all the way through the Vietnam era, I guess the way that wars were waged, a lot of soldiers were coming back with facial injuries. So that's where the academy got started. And believe it or not, even to this day, we have patients that are from the World War II era and some of them I treat for skin cancers and various things, but had some of the most amazing reconstructive procedures for portions of their face being burned in plane crashes and various things. And they're remarkable folks, as you know. But it's really interesting how that was the birth of it. And even the reconstructive techniques that we use now are, a lot, uh, are very much based in what was developed in the Vietnam era. So it's very interesting. And just as an educational point, if you were to get online, not only can you see which of the physicians of yours are members of these various organizations, but also there are educational components for you guys to click onto. And if you're thinking about a specific procedure or some type of treatment, injectable, what have you, often there's some information on these websites. And the reason I mention these in particular is because they're more objective. They're not so sensationalized. It's not a blog. It's not a, uh, you know, somebody trying to sell you something. So that's a, a, nice, a nice resource to have. Of course, as far as training, it's kind of an important thing to me personally, um, having gone through residency and then through fellowship and really focusing a pretty good chunk of my practice just on this, it lends itself to experience. And just as in anything else, without experience, you don't have as much skill. Um, so the right answer is you look at what background your physician has. Just because they claim to be board certified, well, you have to ask them, well, what are you board certified in? What's your background? Because you'll see a board certified internal medicine doctor or even a board certified OBGYN doctor that's wanting to inject your face with Botox or fillers and that type of thing. And you'll think, well, you know, that's not that aggressive a procedure. Anybody can do it. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, if you don't understand the anatomy and even the aesthetic uh, painting or picture that you're trying to create, you may not hit it right on. And of course, what happens in our situation, people will come to me from having had Botox elsewhere, or fillers elsewhere, and may not have had great results. And they're totally turned off to that whole idea. Meanwhile, when they want to achieve a goal, a lot of these tools are the ideal ones for their purposes. So then it takes time for me to convince them that, you know, maybe we should still try this again. It's still worth it. And I have a of Botox patients that have had drooped brows or not able to open their eye for three months because of malpositioned Botox. And meanwhile, if it's done right, it's a brow lift, it's opening everything up, it works great. So that's it. You just have to see, hey, are, are you well trained? Are you board certified? How many of these do you do in a year? Because even after training, if you don't do enough of them, I've been out for over 10 years, 10 and a half, 11 years, it'll be 11 years in September. And you think if I'd only done a facelift a year, that would be 10 lifts in a decade. And that's just not enough to be good at it. So you just have to kind of probe and ask questions. And if somebody's offended by those questions, maybe they're not the right one for you. Um, as far as the process of aging, there are three broad strokes that I generally discuss. One is, of course, the loss of volume. We lose muscle and bone volume as the years go on. 
we lose connective tissue integrity, which is the elastin and collagen fibers, which is why you get the bags and sags. And of course, we lose some of the integrity even in the superficial layers, which are the fine lines and wrinkles. So if you can effectively improve the fine lines, the volume loss, and the laxity, you're going to see an improvement in the overall look. And some folks are busy in their careers, and of course, they don't have the time to necessarily spend getting through recovery and various things which we understand. And that's um, some of these things will focus on the less aggressive or less invasive and we'll move up to some of the surgical things. But the truth is, regardless of what you choose, as long as you improve one of these three big picture items, you're gonna see a better you. You're gonna see an improvement in the, in the, big, in the big picture as you look in the mirror. So of course, here we are in Lakeland. And I grew up in South Florida and Miami, so I know you can go there and try to take care of all these who's who's of Miami and make a huge amount of money. But when you turn on the TV and you see the desperate housewives of everywhere, you see what kind of disasters are created. And a lot of folks are worried or concerned or turned off by this whole discussion because that's what they see. And certainly our celebrities that have these horrendous results are the first ones that come to mind. So in our practice, of course, the most important thing is to create a very natural look. You want to have the look that you started out with, just a better you. You don't want, in the ideal circumstance, that anyone know that the two of us have ever met. So that's the ideal situation. And I really um, pride myself on that. You know, if we don't get every fine line out around your mouth, well, that's a good thing. Why? Because to get it out with a lift leaves you with the joker look. And then people will go, oh, well, Connie did your lift. Well, that's not how that works. People will never know that you and I have ever worked together. So as we start out, non-invasive options are the most common things we talk about nowadays. There are essentially no downtime, no healing time. The results are good. We see good improvements. Botox is the first one of these that we'll talk about. It's a pretty simple thing. It basically blocks the nerve signal to the muscle from, uh, from various means of just blocking the transmitter. And in that setting, what you're going to get is basically a relaxation of the fine lines and wrinkles and that muscle tension. When that happens, and I like to use it primarily in the upper third of the face, you'll see a nice brow lift, you'll see a nice relaxation to the forehead area. And when done properly, it really provides a nice open look. A lot of people will come back after Botox and will literally look at them and say, gosh, I couldn't have achieved more with a surgical brow lift. So. It's a very nice technique. If we're done right, you have a great tool in Botox. Dysport is a similar product to Botox, and it works very well. I use this quite a bit in my practice also. And when it comes to this um, with the Dysport, it, um, it's just to me, now there are various products in this line. They're all botul various botulinum toxins. They work great and they all are competing against one another so it's like having the best case scenario in the free market the more competition the better the prices are for us when it was just botox alone which when i came out that was the only game in town every six months the prices were slowly creeping up and you're like goodness gracious when is this going to end and finally the fda approves a few other products and now it's pretty much leveled off so that's really good and they all work very well. There's Zomed and a couple of other products as well, but Botox and Dysport, just as it happens to be, are the ones that I use most frequently in my practice. Restylane is more of a filler. So the other one takes care of the fine lines superficially. The Restylane adds volume where we lose it. It's made of hyaluronic acid, which is a, a component of our own tissues. It's bioengineered in a lab, so there aren't any allergenic components to it. And it works great. If you look at the lower third of the face where they've treated here, you see that the lip lines are improved quite a bit. And just the general volume looks better because, of course, with regard to the lips, we do lose a lot of volume of the lips as we age. So that's one good way to use it. I use it quite a bit in the furrows through the cheek area, the nasolabial folds. Down here, it's an excellent way to smooth out the uh, jawline, getting rid of the appearance of the jowls quite a bit. So that's another great area to use it. And with regard to fillers, and not just Restylane, but fillers in general, I've been doing a lot of mid-face lifting. We do lose a lot of cheek volume as the years go on. 
the hollowness of the cheek is one of the real telltale signs of aging. So if we can build up that volume and keep it up, it does make a really nice improvement and in a very subtle fashion. Obviously we see these celebrities again that are overdone with their cheeks and their jaw lines and you're like, what in the world happened? And those are done with implants or with overdoing the fillers, but if done in a subtle fashion, it really does improve the look. Juvederm is similar to Restylane. It's also hyaluronic acid. It's a slightly different concentration, but it works just the same in my opinion. Um, it really is a good product as well. Bellatero is also hyaluronic acid, similar situation where the concentration is different in a way that it's excellent for the fine lines. So for some folks that come in specifically for these little fine lines around the lips, I really do reach for this and have had very nice results. Radius is another, comp another product of this whole laundry list of fillers. The other ones are a protein, so they're kind of a, a gel-like material if you were to squirt it into the palm of your hand. And in the thinner skinned areas, the other ones work beautifully. Where we want more volume, this particular thicker product works well. It's a hydroxyapatite paste, so it's like a calcium based. And if you look at it, it's a whitish paste and it is kind of gritty, but it has excellent volume. So for those that need a lot of volume through these nasolabial folds or the jawline, and certainly the cheek mid face area, this is an excellent product. And it lasts a little bit longer than the hyaluronic acid products. The other ones last about six to nine months, sometimes up to a year. This you typically get about 12 months out of it, so it is a little bit better that way. All of these products can be used for reshaping the nose. Uh, another uh, technique where folks that don't want to have surgery done, you can use the fillers quite nicely. Artifil is one of the fillers that claims to have long-lasting uh, results, and the, re and the truth is it does. It has a matrix of this polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, which creates your own collagen. It builds up the collagen volume in the tissues, so it does stay. The 80% component, which is the largest component of the product, the larger volume, is still bovine collagen. So the good old-fashioned collagen, which we used to have as our only filler option about 15 years ago, is still part of this. The downside of it is, Bovine collagen only lasts for about three months. So that's why all these other fillers have become so much more popular. But the good thing about this PMMA, the polymethyl methacrylate, is that you get that matrix to build that collagen, and that lasts forever. So that's the beauty of this. Now, obviously, we continue to age. So even as we talk about surgical techniques and lifts and various things, you're still going to see that there's a lifespan to this. So even with the artifil, folks will come in for touch-ups and redos and all of those things. It's not as frequent as the other ones, um, but it does happen. So it's not like you're going to do this and some folks think that they get a facelift and they're going to look the same for the rest of eternity. It's not true. So that's the downside of any of these things. But it is a good product. We've used it for years and years and have had excellent results. Sculpture is similar in that it relies on the body's own collagen deposition or formation. So the way that this works is this polylactic acid is, an, is created into a powder form. And if you looked at a vial of it before we get started, it just looks like there's something caked onto the glass. You're like, what? there's nothing in here. And then you inject the sterile water or, or, or sterile saline, mix it, and then we inject it. So the initial part of the process is injecting to the correction or the volume that you want. Now the majority of this is obviously the water that we've mixed. So the water will dissipate over the course of a week. And in a week you're looking at it going, I went through all this for what? After the first week is gone, the following three to four weeks, the collagen starts to build around these little particul particulates. And as that happens, you start to see improvement. Generally this takes two, maybe three treatments to get the full correction. The beauty of this stuff is that it lasts for two years. So if you've been doing fillers for a while, and I've had a handful of people that will get everything filled and corrected because again, filler is nice in that you don't have any downtime. I mean, it's, you'll have a little bit of bruising, maybe some swelling, but that's usually just a few days worth. So this is similar that way. You don't have any additional bruising or swelling than you would for any of the other fillers, and the results slowly build up and you're good for a couple of years. So those that have used Restylane or other products through the mid-face and they're just using it 
frequently. They're coming in every six or eight months. I start to talk to them about this, and the results have been very nice. So it's another good option. So now we'll talk uh, somewhat about the resurfacing techniques. Now, when we talk about resurfacing, it's basically to improve the fine lines and wrinkles. It, the deeper you get with this, with any type of resurfacing technique, the more dramatic the results. Obviously, the longer the downtime, because obviously if you take out more of the superficial tissue, it's going to take longer to heal. But as you get through the healing, the results are going to be more dramatic and they're going to last longer. So with in-office procedures, like the superficial chemical peels, you're going to find like they're, that they're like a, a facial. You know, you'll see some good results. They'll last for a couple months, and then you'll probably be back to it. So you kind of look at these superficial things as, well, I'll be better in a couple days. The redness will be gone. But yet, because it's superficial, you're not going to get any long-term uh, longevity to it. But still, a lot of folks that want to do an upkeep type regimen, they love it. And most of these things are done right here in our spa. But basically, it's to help with some of the mild scarring and sun damage and some of the superficial fine lines. But an excellent option. Some that want to achieve that at home will go with different product lines like the Obagi system at home. One of the components of Obagi is the tretinoin or the Retin-A, and that provides a, a little bit of a chemical peel, and it also stabilizes the enzymes that break down the collagen. So it helps in a couple of ways. You also see some improvement with the browns and the reds. So this is a good, good option. And the nice idea behind these systems is that not only is it the peel part of it, but there's also, of course, the various other things, the moisturizers, the blenders, the sunscreen, which in Florida is so important. So it just gets your mind kind of in that set that you want to keep it up. You want to maintain these things. I've done lifts and lasers and peels. I mean, we've done so many things. And those that don't watch their sun exposure and aren't careful about it, it all just starts to fall back. And within weeks sometimes, and you look at it, and you're just, you know, you're heartbroken over it because you've put them through so many things. And if you look at these before and afters, you look at it and go, gosh, we got 20 years for you. Don't throw it all away, that, you know, in 12 months. So it's, it's, it's something that I really talk quite a bit about because it's, it's important. And it doesn't matter what brand. I mean, Obagi is just something that I trained with when I was back in fellowship. But it doesn't matter. There's so many product lines out there that are all very good, um, as long as you kind of have all the components and that mindset that even going out to check the mail in this Florida sunshine, you're getting a ton of sun exposure. So you have to keep that in mind. Microdermabrasion is a very superficial technique, just like the in-office superficial peels. Again, it's going to get rid of the superficial layer, give you some relief with some of the mild sun damage, mild um, scarring, and just the overall texture of the skin improves. So people like it, but it's often combined with a facial, and it works well for those that want to keep things up. Now we'll talk a little bit about office lasers. Some of them can be used for resurfacing, but there are also other uh, reasons to go with the office lasers. Some have unwanted hair, spider veins, various things, even just improving the general look of the skin um, are ways in which we can use these office lasers. Now the laser techni technology, the way that it works, is that there's something in the tissue called a chromophore. In the setting of trying to get rid of the spider veins, it's the hemoglobin, the molecule in the blood, you know, the blood cells. Um, for hair removal, it's the melanin at the base of the hair follicle. So the laser light at a particular wavelength will actually be drawn to that particular molecule and it'll obliterate that tissue. So with regard to the hemoglobin, the laser light concentrates into the base of that blood cell, obliterates the vessel, and the spider vein's gone. So that's how all this works. So the YAG laser is excellent for spider veins and for hair removal. Infrared is more specific for hair removal. IPL is pulsed light and not necessarily a laser, more of a technical thing, but what that means for us is that it provides a broad wavelength of light and it tries to attack different things. So at certain settings you can do hair removal with it, at others you treat the browns and the reds. When it first came out, of course any surgeon or doctor wants to have one machine that does everything, you know, and everybody was signing up and trying to sell it for everything that you could possibly dream of. As it turns out, it's good for very specific things. The browns and the reds respond very well to it, so I use it for that. Some do have improvement with regard to hair removal with it, so I'll use it for that, but that's about it. So fine lines and wrinkles, these photo facials that you can get with the IPL, not really. You'll see the browns and the reds fade out, but not the fine lines. 
Radio frequency I leave in there. I don't believe in it at all, but it's just something that people have advertised over the years. Um, thermage is a very common term for this. They claim to tighten up the neck and the abdomen and all these things without surgery. It just doesn't work. I've had people come back, come in for initial consultation. I tell them, look, this neck's not going anywhere unless we lift it. And then they go elsewhere. They get talked into thermage. They'll have spent, you know, goodness, six, seven thousand dollars over the course of several visits and still have the same neck, what they started out with. Maybe a little bit smoother skin, but still the waddle. And at that point, they're very aggravated that they spent all that money and that they're going to have to spend the same amount again to get a lift. So it's just better to start out with what makes sense. Now, in office, we can do some resurfacing and even some more aggressive resurfacing. There are various lasers. Fraxel is basically just a catchphrase. It's, to me, like Kleenexes for tissues. There may be 500 brands of a box of tissues, but we all call it Kleenex. Fraxel is just a brand, and they were probably the first ones to market it heavily, but it's fractionated technology. So if you look at a laser, we talked about the whole chromophore idea. Well, there's also the amount of surface area of the tissue that's treated with a laser that is part of this picture. So if you treat the entire surface area of your skin, the only component that has the little epithelial cells that will have to regrow is at the very base of the hair follicles, because of course those sit a little bit deeper and those rests of cells will slowly grow back over the entire surface that you've treated. That takes a long time, and of course, it leads to a lot of redness and slow healing. So instead, they've come up with this idea where you can spot treat. You can pinpoint and treat the same surface area, but if you were to think about it, you're only treating 50% or 70% or maybe even 20 or 30% of that skin. So those intervening rests of epithelial cells will grow back quicker, the healing is faster, but they surmise that they kind of say, well, visually, it's still going to be a nice improvement to that tissue, so why not do it that way? And they've hit on a good thought. It's worked out well. It does lead to less downtime. But again, because you're not treating the full surface area, I will say that the results are not as dramatic. So you have to keep that in mind. And with the fractional technology, there are various lasers. One we have is the non-ablative restore. So the downtime is much less with this. In fact, it's down to a few days. But because of that, it requires a series of treatments. So you'll come in for a treatment roughly once a month over the course of somewhere between four and six months, and then you'll be done with the regimen. And they are good results. I mean, you'll still see a lot of the photo damage having been improved, and a lot of the fine lines have faded out. So it is a good way to go. But because it's gradual, you won't see it as dramatic of a change right off the bat. And because, of course, it's not as aggressive, it may not be as dramatic. So you have to keep that in mind as far as the pros and cons. Now, the ablative Fraxel is the Fraxel Repair. And it is a much more aggressive laser in that it actually does get rid of a lot of the superficial tissue. And in fact, these lasers, you can literally dial in the depth and the percentage of treatment. So that's where, as a retentive surgeon, I'm very happy with the lasers, even more so than the chemical peels, because you can really see the results as you're working, and you can tell, obviously, because you're that precise with the machine. So I like this. I mean, with this, you can get as aggressive as the traditional in OR laser, if you really dialed it up. However, folks that want to get you know, through the recovery faster, we do kind of a moderate treatment, and I have seen some nice results with it. So here you'll see that a lot of the deeper furrows improve a bit better with the repair. The recovery from this is not just a few days, it takes about a week. Um, but for those that have that week to spend, it's, it's probably a good option. And price-wise, they're comparable. So, um, and that's kind of my doing. I've tried to set them relatively similar so that you're making the decision based on the technology and what you're trying to achieve, not so much just the price point. So now we'll move on to some of the other options that do require often a little bit of sedation um, and are a little bit more of a recovery associated. So the traditional lasers are the CO2 or the erbium. The Fraxel repair that we just talked about is actually a CO2 wavelength laser. So that's why I mentioned that if you dial it up, it's about the same as what you get with this. For this te particular technology, I take folks to the OR. I think with sedation, it's best. You get a great result. It is very dramatic. For those of us that have lived in Florida forever, 
as we get up in years, we'll find that the sun damage is significant. You'll see a lot of the fine lines and furrows. I often talk about that movie, Something About Mary, that Magda was that old lady next door, and she uh, is just sitting there with that reflective thing, sun on her face 24 hours if she could a day. And with that, unfortunately, we do see those patients come to our office, and this traditional laser is really the only good option at that point. It does take a couple of weeks, two to three weeks, to really heal even the initial phase. The redness can last for a couple few months, but it's still, for those that want a more impressive result, a very good option, so I still use it. I stick with CO2 because that's what I trained with in, in fellowship, and that's what they've had here at the Surgery Center for years. So I found that it's, for me, it's been a good transition, but if anybody talks to you about erbium, it's got the same merits. It's actually a very good option as well. Um, deeper chemical peels will actually get to that same depth of penetration as a laser that's more aggressive. Um, these TCA, trichloroacetic acid peels with some of the cleansers like Jesner's solution, various things are excellent. They do get rid of the deeper lines. They're best done with sedation again because you're getting to that depth which is a little bit difficult to achieve without some type of anesthesia. But the truth is, because the lasers are so much more precise, like I mentioned, you can really dial up the, the depth of penetration. Even with the CO2, the traditional one, you visually see the changes in the skin. Whereas with the peels, you kind of just paint the solution on and you wait for the reaction, but there's limitations. With lasers, you can come up to the lash line, literally. With peels, you don't want to get close to the eye because if it unfortunately gets into the eye, you're burnt the surface of the eye. It's horrible. So. I really don't do as much peeling because I find that lasers are so much more precise. That's just been my approach, but if somebody were to talk to you about peel options and, and or if you're really dead set on it, it's certainly a good way to go. It works well. Fat transfer is another way to achieve a fill, so volume. Now with this, you're basically harvesting fat from the abdomen or the flank and refining it and then re-injecting it, and it works reasonably well. Some folks think that it's a graft of their own tissue, so it's going to be 100% perfect and it's going to last forever. So that's where it's not exactly accurate. With any graft of fat, you're going to see that about a third of it lasts and the rest of it fades away. Obviously, we continue to age, so you're going to see that component. And the fact is you have to sedate so you can get some of that um, harvesting done. So it's, it's not perfect in some ways. The reason I've left this slide in over the years is because just as every other realm of medicine, um, stem cell research is one of the things at the forefront. And the theory is that if, if, if you do infuse fat, uh, stem cells rather into the fat that you've harvested, then the longevity of that fat is longer and of course the take of the graft is better. So they're saying that it may get to the point where stem cell infiltration will be 95% of take in, instead of 33%. So at that point, maybe these folks that come up with the stem cell research and the stem just market it and sell it, these machines now cost probably a million dollars. But over years, obviously, if it becomes more widespread, it'll be very tolerable price-wise. That may put all these filler companies out of business because that may be the next you know, step in our, in our future. So it's something to think about, you know, keep your uh, eyes and ears open. It may get to that point, but not yet. So we'll talk a little bit about all the various facelift options. Now, as we talk about these lift options, just keep in mind that the true integrity of the lift is always in the deeper tissue. The reason she had so many facelifts is because the first facelifts were skin only. And if you only tighten up the skin, unfortunately, skin likes to sag back. And when I take out these huge skin cancers and we'll rotate a facelift flap, literally, to close a huge hole on the temple, we rotate all this tissue up, and you look at it when you're done and you think, gosh, you know, I've just done a one-sided facelift, I'm gonna have to go to the other side and lift it. But because I'm very meticulous and just lifting the skin alone, Truth be told, in about four to six weeks, you start to see that it's almost perfectly symmetric. At three months, you won't even tell that one side was lifted. So if you don't do the lift properly, in terms of dealing with the deeper tissue, by about a year, you're gonna have lost all of it. And that's why these big companies like Lifestyle Lift and various other ones are not doing you any, any favors. I mean, you'll spend a lot of money and you'll get 
for the most part, a skin-only lift. They do a little bit with the muscle, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in a minute. But it's just not good enough, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, all right, so the mini face lift is the lifestyle lift for all intents and purposes. It's been a technique that's been used for decades. In fact, it was first described in the 60s or 70s. Um, a doc by the name of Sam Hammer, I think, is the first one to kind of talk about this. But the truth is, it's a limited incision, limited dissection. You lift the muscle in the proper technique. You lift the muscle, and it works. It does work for those folks that just have minimal laxity and want to have a little bit of a tuck up. This is a good technique. Now they try to market it as a solution for everybody and the lunchtime or you know quickie lift thing uh, doesn't necessarily work for all of us. You know some have more laxity and need more work done than others and of course the downside of doing a quickie procedure is that it only lasts for about a year or so. A lot of folks that have had this done are very aggravated that they spent thousands of dollars to have such a short-term result. And of course, when we talk about lifestyle in specific, my concern there is that it does turn out to be kind of a facelift factory. You kind of show up and you're one of several procedures that day that will be done by the surgeon and it's not ideal. Um, generally speaking, they recruit docs that are right out of training because it's attractive to them to have a volume of patients waiting to have surgery versus trying to build something like what I've had to do here. Um, but that's another thing that may not be ideal for the individual going through it. And I know a lot about it because they, they recruited me, I interviewed, I've, I've been through the, through the gamut with them and I just was turned off because I don't get to do this. I mean, their interaction as a surgeon with the patient is negligible. They're just a line worker out back just doing the lift after lift. So not ideal, but in the right setting, if you just want a little bit of a lift, you can still have the mini lift done. The main thing that differs in my technique is that I really do spend a lot of time lifting the muscle and putting in the deep tissue sutures, not just a whip stitch or a circular suture in the front and the back. I put, you know, eight or ten sutures to really get that tightened up well. And that's where the longevity comes. A lot of the procedures I do nowadays are with contouring the neck and that's because a lot of times we'll find that the neck is the main issue where we start to see the bands and the sags. Uh, basically the bands, the two little bands that we see here are because the two muscles, the platysma muscles that are on either side initially are bound together with the thick heavy connective tissue that keeps all of our bags and sags from showing up. Over time that weakens and then the two muscles kind of fall forward and that's when we start to see these. So in contouring the neck you basically get down to those muscles, tighten them up with suture which then recreates that band of connective tissue and then tighten it all back up behind the ear and it creates a very nice contour to the neck and the jawline actually so it works out very well. Now of course coupled with that tightening of the muscle is liposculpting and lipocontouring and that really finishes off the picture. So those that have more jowls and more of these bands and sags have a very nice result with the contouring of the neck coupled with that mini lift. I've been very happy with this and I, th I would say that this is kind of the workhorse for me a lot of what I do with the mini lift and contouring the neck is what a lot of people will call a full face lift. So it does require time to heal. In fact, it'll be a good three weeks before everything is kind of settled in. But spending that time healing initially is well worth it to give you good long-term results. So for some, the full face lift, which is the more traditional approach, is still the right way to go. If folks come in with this heavy neck, it's very difficult to give them that type of result without the full facelift. So in the right setting, this is still a very good option. And basically the difference is you do more contouring of the neck in terms of putting deep sutures in. And of course, there are ways to pull back. I use, often use something called an endotine ribbon to really lift the neck up. So there's a bit more work in that muscular layer that's done with this. And it's, and it's worthwhile. I mean, the results are good and long lasting with that. So in the right setting, you still have to do this. Now, direct neck lifting is very specific to the turkey neck. And generally in my practice, it's just for guys. You know, for men, it's interesting. We shave practically every day. So it keeps the collagen, it's like getting a little bit of a chemical peel or a microderm, more like a dermabrasion every single day. So the, that's one component. The other side of it is that to support the hair follicles, the skin needs more integrity, uh, more thickness. So those are reasons why if you look at a guy, even in his 60s, 
you'll probably notice that there aren't very many uh, bags and sags. There's not much in the formation of jowls. Um, and it's amazing, but you don't have to do as much here. But yet the neck doesn't have as much integrity. So for guys, a lot of times it's just dealing with this. And all that means is getting rid of the waddle and tightening it up. The downside is that it does leave a zigzag incision at the front of the neck. Now for guys, because we wear you know, collared shirts and various things, it doesn't show as much. And even, I don't know why, but the fact that we have hair bearing skin here, that incision high, fades so well. I mean, not that they grow their beard out, just as a matter of healing, it's very difficult to see. For women, because of course the scoop neck clothing and various things, it draws more attention to the neck. And the other side is because the skin is a little bit finer, not as thick, the incision seems more evident. So some women have wanted to have this done, and I've done it, but mostly it's guys that seem to benefit most. But as you can see, it doesn't do anything really for the jawline. It just helps with the turkey neck, all that fullness there. So a good option. So this is that endotine ribbon. So I'll put this in the neck when we're doing the full face lifts frequently. I'll also use this for the jowl specifically. You can pick up the jowl and bring it up to the temple and really bring that fat back into its normal position. A lot of times when we look at these bags and sags here, you start to wonder, well, why is it here and not here or what's going on? That's because of the way that the connective tissue weakens and we have certain rests of fat that sit higher in the cheek when we're young and as time goes on it descends down so the jowl is actually this buckle fat you know fat that sits higher in the cheek so if you can pick that up with this type of ribbon and reposition it it works well this particular product is actually resorbable material so it leaves that integrity for several months long enough for that tissue to scar into its position and then it just dissolves it fades out so it's very nice I use, uh, you know, for these deeper tissue areas, it works out very well. Mid-face lifting is something that I do a little bit less of nowadays, in fact, quite a bit less of, because we have the fillers. The fillers are a great way to contour and achieve good symmetry to the mid-face. In fact, with fillers, it's kind of like sculpting. You, we're all asymmetric to some degree or another, and you can add a little bit more volume to one side or the other with the fillers to accommodate for that. With the lifts, basically you're lifting this uh, cheek fat pad that descends down to the, create the nasolabial fold, the fullness, and you lift it back up onto the cheekbone. So it provides a nice contour, but again, we're gonna continue to age, so that'll slowly descend down. With fillers, you can achieve almost as good a result. In fact, in a lot of people, sometimes a better result because of that asymmetry issue that I mentioned. But it's a good way if some folks come in and they still want a more permanent thing than fillers, this would be a good option. Um, often I'll couple this with a cheek implant so it provides good long-term volume because we're going to continue to lose the muscle and bone volume with time, but that implant will stay there forever. So that's another way to kind of accommodate for the aging with time. With eye lifting, it's interesting. You'll see the fullness or the hooding over the upper eyelids and that kind of creates that sleepy look and folks come in and tell me, gosh, I'm not tired at all, but yet people always ask me, did you sleep? What's going on? Why are you so exhausted? So lifting the eyelids, getting that excess skin out of the way brightens up the picture, and it is a nice way to go. It's pretty simple as, as far as eye lifting, and some of the mini lifts, by the way, we do right here in the office. So it is an easy, easy fix, relatively quick healing, and good results. Um, even for older folks, when the skin gets so heavy that it obscures the peripheral field of vision, insurance will often cover this. So it's another way to, uh, to improve the look. Um, this is more aesthetic, just that fullness, but you can see where, uh, for all of us, eye contact is the first thing we make as we communicate with each other. And, and somehow in our subconscious, we equate the look of the eyes to the health of the individual, whether they're rested, as I mentioned, or even just the overall well-being. And when you see all this, you're like, gosh, what's wrong with him? And yet, when you get it all fixed and cleared up, it, it's not like he looks unusual or abnormal. He just looks more natural, and that's the goal. Some of our younger patients will come in, and the ladies will say, gosh, you know, my eye makeup gets all over the place. This is so aggravating. And a lot of them are younger, just like this young, young lady. And they, they basically come in and say, you know, I was born with this fullness. I just want to get rid of it. It's, it's really aggravating. Some will have some subtle asymmetries one side to the other, and they say, gosh, in pictures, it just doesn't look right. So even younger, you know, I've done eye lifts for as young as 
26, 27 year olds. And one of the girls actually brought her parents in. They both said, you know, we had to wait till we were 50. Nobody would operate on us till we were turned 50. And this is just the genetic thing. Everybody in the family has this. So we went ahead and did it, and she's been the happiest girl, you know, for years. I've known her probably almost as long as I've been in practice, and she's done great. So again, it just is such a nice uh, overall look. Now, with brow lifting, of course, when we look at the eyes, as I mentioned, eye contact is the first thing. If you can do anything to frame the eyes without drawing attention away from the eyes, that's ideal. So as the nose contours to the brow around the eyes, if it looks natural and opens out the eyes, that's the best scenario. So you want to use brow lifting as an adjunct to an eye lift in frequent cases. These are not my pictures, by the way. All these pictures that I've shown you today are not our patients. I have thousands of pictures back there as we've amassed them over the years. But Lakeland's a small enough community that I didn't want you all walking out the door going, I knew she had something <laughs> done. So in a sense, we can sit here and critique this, in my opinion, is not a great brow lift because there's not a nice arch to the brow. It's that quote unquote deer in headlights or surprised look. And that's what you want to avoid. And if you can get it right, and for most folks nowadays, if they do want a brow lift done, I'll do what's called a lateral brow lift. So you just want a little bit of an opening out at the outer part of the brow. If you look at any uh, young woman's picture, you'll see that they have just a little bit of an arch under the brow. It's not that the entire brow sits up real high. In fact, you'll find that the central part of the brow sits kind of low, close to the eyelid. And that's just because we have a fat pad that lives here and creates that arch to the brow. When we lift the brow, we're not recreating the fat pad. We're just kind of relying on the bony part of the, eye, the rim of the eye socket to create that illusion that that fat pad is still there. Bottom line is, if you have that nice arch and contour, it looks natural, it looks right. If you have it halfway up the forehead, then it looks weird. Um, kind of a side note, but the highest concentration of plastic surgeons are in Washington, D.C., not in Hollywood or Manhattan. Surprisingly, all these politicians want to look younger. And Nancy Pelosi, when she had her brow lift done, she looked ridiculous. Ridiculous. I mean, she was giving uh, the rebuttal to the State of the Union, I remember this pretty clearly, to George W. And boy, she must have been just horrified by George W.'s words, or she had a really bad brow lift. And I think she had a bad brow lift because the look didn't go away for quite a while. Now that she's aged, the brows have kind of come down. But you can actually see how hollow her eyelids are. Mm -hmm. And that's because they've taken out too much fat from this area and lifted the brow too much. So she's another example of not ideal plastic surgery. So in that setting, like I mentioned, you want to frame the eye. So the nose is part of that. And you want a nice looking tip and bridge and everything else. But you want to keep the nose breathing. Years ago, destructive rhinoplasty, as I call it, was the norm. They would shave down the bridge and pare down the tip and create these little ski slope noses for everybody's face. Your face could be this big and your nose would be that big. So a lot of those we have to reconstruct nowadays. We have to actually add tissue volume back, add cartilage back. So you want, of course, a nose that looks like it belonged on your face from birth. You don't want something that looks done. And everybody's perception is a bit different. I did one rhinoplasty, it's probably been about four or five years now. But it was a teacher came in for the summer. She had kind of that big bump and wide tip. And if you looked at it before and after, the result was excellent. But she was very aggravated that when she went back in the fall, nobody knew that she had rhinoplasty. And I said, that's perfect. In fact, that's exactly what you want. You want a nose that looks beautiful, but looks like you be belong with it. And she was like, oh, OK, I guess so. But I mean, when you look at the before and afters, you're like, my goodness, it was pointing down and all this big old parrot nose and here it is turned up. And so you want this. This is what you want. And I like this picture. I think it's nice. You have a nice upturn, nice proportion. You've lost that big bump. But if you look at the proportion of her face, it fits very well. And same with this. You know, it's not this little ski slope pared down thing, but it's a little refinement through the tip and just a little bit of bringing down that bridge and it breathes well. That's the most important thing. Here you see this crooked, deviated nose. 
if you straighten it up and keep it proportioned, it'll breathe well. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't matter what a nose looks like. It could be the most beautifully created, sculpted, aesthetic nose. If you can't breathe through it, it's useless. People will come in and they'll be so aggravated, so miserable. And nowadays, because I have the background in ENT as well as in plastic surgery, I do a ton of reconstructive rhinoplasty coupled with sinus procedures and, and whatnot. And those are the happiest patients. I mean, they'll sit in your chair and go, they'll just literally take this huge whiff of air and go, gosh, I could never do this. This is the best feeling ever. I can sleep through the night. I can jog. I can play ball. I can do all this stuff. So that's a huge thing. And, and it really drives it home to me that you really have to focus. And this, to me, is an excellent look. You're really drawing attention to her beautiful big eyes, not to a little tiny nose that is sitting on her face. So of course you've created a more straight nose and fixed the tip, and that deviated nose usually means that the septum inside is deviated and blocking up her airway. So in this case, I'm sure she functions and breathes better. My practice is kind of, like I mentioned, across the board in terms of reconstruction. I do a lot of work with the cleft lip and palate kids. A lot of them, this is the most mild form of quote unquote ear deformity where they have that more prominent ear. A lot of our patients over the years have been little girls that are gymnasts or cheerleaders and they wear their hair back and have these big ears protruding out and they just get them tacked back a little bit and a little bit of contouring. Procedures quick and the results are very nice and they're the happiest little patients and of course with our cleft lip and palate patients it is truly a, a blessing to be able to do some of those things for these kids. I've traveled abroad and it's probably the most rewarding thing in my practice, bar none. And quite frankly, that's the reason I got involved in plastics to begin with. Um, reconstructive surgery is definitely um, near and dear to my heart, and that's why I started out. I love the aesthetic side of my practice. I, I enjoy it, but um, traveling and doing the cleft work is really the, the, most, uh, the gr biggest blessing that I, I find uh, in my life, in my practice. Um, when we talk a little bit about this lifting, I probably should have put this slide in earlier, but really you can put in some implantables and really improve the contour of the lift or of the, uh, the mid-face. It really does look good. I saw a consultation this week where really she said, gosh, all my life people have told me my lip is too big, her lower lip. I said, that's not the case. Your chin is just gone. <laughs> it makes your lip look bigger. So if you can contour the face in total, just the big picture, regardless of what technique you use, you're gonna create a better picture. So that's just the take home in, at, at the end of this. And again, you know, the things that I do in my practice are across the board. We do a lot of reconstruction. I'd still take out a lot of cancers and tumors and put things back together. And some folks say, gosh, you know, I've done 5,000 facelifts. I've done not quite that many, but thousands. And the truth is, after all is said and done, if you can take everything apart and put it back together, I think it's made me a much better surgeon. And of course, when we talk about the pitfalls of facelifting and various other surgeries we've discussed, it's not nicking the nerve or not getting into bleeding, not getting into various things. And when you do some of these bigger surgeries, you know where those pitfalls lie and you know how to avoid them.